Terrific, terrific. So as they indicated, I'm Elizabeth Kautz and I am the registered dietitian for Kendall Crossland's communities. Um, and as, as Lori indicated, I have been there a long time. I'm just, I think actually Monday, I've been there 26 years. So a long time with a great organization um, that if you're not aware, it just provides wonderful care um, in a continuing care facility. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about age-proofing your brain and the role nutrition plays in that. By the time we're done, you'll be able to identify modifiable lifestyle um, habits that impact brain health, understand the role diet has in maximizing brain health, and be able to identify three superfoods. So modifiable risk factors. Um, as far as your brain and aging, Certain amount of it we don't have control of. Our genetics do play a role, but we have other modifiable risk factors that we do have control over. Um, and they're not new modifiable risk factors. They're exercise, smoking cessation, social connections, and of course our diet. Um, and we'll touch on these four modifiable risk factors and then we'll really go in depth into the diet. So when we talk about taking care of your brain, we're doing so through preventative maintenance and it's sort of like how we would take care of our car. Um, we know that when, we, when a car um, sits too long and doesn't get used, it doesn't run very well. And our brain is much the same way. And we wanna take really good care of our brain because it's, argument, it's one of our most important organs in our whole body um, and maximizing and preventing diseases um, that can affect the brain is key because we want that to be running as well as possible. Um, and research has shown that by being physically active, eating a healthy diet, um, taking good care of our hearts um, and challenging our brain through um, social connections and continuing to learn all makes the brain work more, um, more efficiently and maintains um, kind of age proofs it. Physical activity in the aging brain, so important. Um, we know we wanna aim for a minimum of 30 minutes of physical activity every day. Um, and the reason for that is physical activity improves neurological function. And it doesn't have to be a full 30 minutes um, continuous. It could be three 10 minute intervals, um, but that, uh, little amount of physical activity um, helps stimulate bro um, brain growth. And it stimulates this through um, increasing the neurons. Um, and your exercise, exercise works for the brain much the same way exercise works for the muscle and helps it develop um, and stimulates those neurological pathways. Next slide I really like, because it shows the impact of exercise on the brain. Um, the one on the left shows a brain that has, that's been sitting and has not been physically active. The body hasn't been physically active. And as you can see, it doesn't look like much is going on. Um, but when we look at the brain on the left, after just 20 minute, a 20 minute walk, we can see that those neurons are firing, that there's a lot more activity going on. So that's really important because that stimulation of neurons, um, especially in the brain is, helps the brain in areas that are responsible for learning and memory. It's called the cerebral hippocampus. Um, another key thing that exercise does is it reduces insulin resistance, which we know um, this reduction in insulin resistance um, reduces inflammation. And I'm sure we've all heard about the role inflammation plays in the body um, and it is not good for the brain. We wanna minimize that. Quitting smoking, um, we know how bad smoking is. The research has been out for a long time about the, um, the role smoking plays in lung disease, cardiovascular disease, but now we know that it's also not good for our brains. Research has shown um, that people who smoke, it tends to actually shrivel the brain and particularly it thins the outer vortex of the brain, which is crucial for cognition. So we wanna maintain that um, cortex as much as we can and keep it from thinning. 
um, because we need that cortex. It's responsible um, for the brain doing things like mental calculations and spatial reasoning. So we definitely don't wanna do anything that's gonna minimize that. Um, the good news is that if you quit smoking, the brain can regenerate over time, but it takes a long time. Um, so the best advice is of course, never to start smoking, but if you um, have, if you do smoke is to quit um, and quit as soon as you can. Protecting our head. Um, this may seem like, like literally a no brainer, but we know that covering and protecting our brain is truly important in, in age proofing it because people that suffer head traumas or even minor head injuries are more prone to have cognition issues later on. Um, so that we just wanna protect it by wearing helmets. Um, we do this a great job with children, but as people get older, they tend to think that they don't need to wear helmets. Um, um, we wanna protect from concussions. We wanna wear seatbelts in the car because head injuries are common. Um, in car accidents. So do whatever we can to protect this most vital organ. Social connections, super important. Um, having purpose in our lives um, and having increased level of engagement is key in preventing dementia. Um, people who meet often with family and friends have a lower incidence of cognition issues. Um, and this has been, I have to say, a real challenge over the last two years um, with all of the COVID um, things that we've been through and people being in social isolation and lockdowns. We have seen a real decline in people's cognition. Um, that, so during those times and if is maintaining social interactions, that's why Kendall, we're so happy that we're able to open up our dining rooms again and get people sharing a meal because one of the most basic social connections we make is, is partaking in a meal together. Um, and I can tell you as a dietitian who works with people who are, who are aging, people eat so much better when they eat in the dining room as opposed to receiving a tray and eating alone in their room. Um, I just can't tell you how happy I was when we were able to open back up our dining rooms um, and get residents back together. And I definitely have seen an, improve, an improvement in their intakes and a decline in weight loss. They're really, really important. And of course, maintaining a healthy weight. Um, and th this is for a variety of reasons. Um, maintaining a healthy weight is closely linked to brain health because it makes the body healthy and a healthy body is key to a healthy brain and exercise significantly improves health in many ways from helping to maintain that healthy weight to keeping cholesterol levels in check and maintaining good blood flow in the body and brain and encouraging the growth of new brain cells and connections. Um, and the MIND diet has been gaining a lot of very interesting um, buzz because it's been able to show really good results for combining the aspects of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet to create an eating plan focused on actual brain health and namely the prevention of dementia and age-related cognition decline. Um, and it's made up of what we call superfoods. Um, superfoods including green leafy vegetables, um, nuts, berries, beans, legumes, whole grains, fish and poultry. Um, and it gives recommendations for how much of these we need to eat each day. Um, but it's really shown some really great research um, that's been really exciting. So we'll talk about it. Please. So I think a lot of people are um, aware of the Mediterranean diet. That's gotten a lot of traction. Um, but also it fused not only the Mediterranean diet, but it fused it with the DASH diet. And the DASH diet is again, another acronym that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stock Hypertension. Um, and this diet was created out of research done by the National Institute of Health um, that wanted to look at how to um, reduce hypertension. 
and it looked at lowering blood pressure, but it did it so in a way that didn't just focus on a low sodium diet as we're usually um, familiar with when we're talking about hypertension, um, but it looked at including things like um, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, low fat dairy and non-dairy, um, non-fat dairy products. It emphasized whole grains and had a reduction in refined grains um, compared with the typical American diet. The DASH diet is rich in potassium, magnesium, calcium, and fiber. Um, and they found that people that followed this diet also tend to have better cognitive scores. The Mediterranean diet, I know we've heard about, um, but when you look at um, the area um, where the Mediterranean diet is followed, they also have the, one of the highest levels of centurions in the world. Um, it's considered a blue zone. Um, and they, they have an aging population that ages quite well. Not only do they live a long time, but their health remains good um, throughout their lifetime. So they, we looked at the eating habits of the Mediterranean and found, hmm, they combine certain foods that really seem to have these properties. So they did more research and they fused these diets together to get the best of the Mediterranean and the best of the DASH diet um, and saw really positive results in cognition scores and um, anti-Alzheimer's anti and a way to treat Alzheimer's. So we'll talk more about that. Also, those, this diet shows us foods that we want to avoid, foods that we know having a large um, consumption of is damaging. Um, the DASH diet limits intakes of sweets, pastries to less than five servings per week. It limits our intake of butter and margarine to less than a tablespoon per day. Red meat is diminished um, to four servings per week. Um, and when you talk about a serving of red meat, it's a minimal serving at that. It's the size of a deck of cards, it's four ounces. So, um, you know, reduction to what our typical serving might be. Um, it reduces our intake of whole fat cheeses to one serving or less per week. Um, and it reduces the intake of fried foods as well. So how does this MIND diet work? Um, it does so because it reduces oxidative stress and inflammation on the body. Um, current research hasn't been able to show the exact mechanism of how this works, but what they've found so far is um, it reduces oxidative stress and inflammation. Oxidative stress occurs when unstable molecules called free, free radicals accumulate in the body in large quantities. This often damages the cell and the brain is especially vulnerable to this type of damage. Inflammation in our body is the body's natural response to injury and infection. But when not properly regulated, inflammation can also be harmful and can contribute to many chronic diseases. Together, oxidative stress and inflammation can be quite detrimental to our brains. And in recent years, they have been the focus of some interventions to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. Following the Mediterranean and DASH diets is associated with lower levels of oxidative stress and inflammation. So knowing this, they combined them and made this hybrid diet and found that they had a reduction um, because they had increased antioxidants and anti-inflammatory effects. Antioxidants are found in things like berries, vitamins, vitamin E, olive oil, green leafy vegetables, nuts um, that also have a preventative um, response in reducing oxidative stress. So in summary, researchers believe that the antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects of these foods encourage the MIND diet and help to lower the risks of dementia and slow the loss of brain function. So pretty exciting um, that, that we've come up with this. Now I'm just gonna give a very brief, what I call my, my one slide of um, chemistry lesson, just on how this actually works. Oxidation and free radicals. Um, Every cell in our body needs oxygen, and it's, it's a normal, necessary part of living. Free radicals are formed in cells when the body burns oxygen. Free radicals can also um, form 
from environmental factors such as smoking, ultraviolet light, and exposure to pollutants. So what we want to do is um, stabilize these free radicals. These free radicals are very unstable, they're highly reactive, um, and they can damage the cells. Oxidation occurs when free radicals steal the electron from the cell in the hopes of becoming more stable. This loss of electron can damage the cell and over time and repeated reactions cause health problems. Now, if we think about other um, times when we see oxidation, um, you can see how this could happen because when we think about oxidation in metals, what happens, the metals such as iron is they rust. So it's a similar reaction happening in our cells um, and, and we don't wanna be rusty. So we wanna have these react, um, minimize this. Um, oxidative stress is a condition where the production of oxidants and free radicals exceeds the body's ability to defend itself. Free radicals can cause this damage to the cell's DNA and may cause the cell to multiply uncontrollably. The MIND diet has also been shown to be effective because it reduces um, harmful beta amyloid proteins. Um, and this is particularly exciting because these beta amyloid proteins are protein fragments found naturally in the body. However, if they, when they, they can accumulate and form plaques that build up in our brains, disrupting the communication between brain cells and eventually leading brain cell death. In fact, scientists believe that these plaques are the primary cause of Alzheimer's. Um, and an animal and test tube study suggests that a diet rich in antioxidants and vitamins, um, such as in the MIND diet, can, can help to prevent the formation of these beta amyloid plaques. Um, in addition, the MIND diet limits foods such as saturated fats and trans fats, which studies have shown increased beta amyloid production um, in the brains of mice. Um, and in human observational studies, they found that consuming these diets were associated with double the risk of Alzheimer's. So pretty good information out there that we, we wanna take a look at this type of eating and try to um, make sure we're following that to minimize our risks and improve our brain health. So the MIND diet is composed of what we call superfoods. Um, superfoods are foods that um, are the superheroes of our diet. They are diets that are rich. Um, these superfoods are rich in vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Um, they provide a nutrition packed punch for every bite. Um, for the calories you're consuming, you're getting a lot of nutrition. They're not empty calories um, when we talk about superfoods. And they're one of what we want to make sure our pantry is full of. These phytochemicals, um, when we talk about phytochemicals, phyto um, comes from the Greek word meaning plant. Um, and they are the molecules in our food that give food its taste, its aroma, its color, and its characteristics. Um, why it's so important to eat a colorful plate. Um, it's not just, just that it looks pretty, but when you see those bright colors on your plate coming from fruits and vegetables, um, you're seeing foods that are rich in these phytochemicals. And there are literally thousands of phytochemicals and not all of them have been identified. Um, and that's why it's so important to eat the whole food um, as opposed to trying to take um, supplements and derivatives because we don't know all of the um, molecules and they work together and create a lot of synergy um, that promotes our good health. So when you just take a supplement, you're not necessarily getting the full synergistic effect that you'd get in the whole food. Antioxidants are present in foods. Um, they are, antioxidants are important substances in our foods because they can help to slow or prevent the oxidative damage. Um, when our body cells use that oxygen, they naturally produce those free radicals that can cause, the dam can cause damage. 
Antioxidants act as free radical scavengers and hence repair the damage done by the free radical, um, which is why we wanna make sure we're getting plenty of antioxidants in our diet. And we get them from foods um, rich in vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals, things like vitamin A and carotenoids that we find in carrots and squash, broccoli, sweet potatoes, rich colors, things like vitamin C that we find in our citrus foods, like oranges, limes, lemons, um, and of course, berries um, that are packed with phytochemicals and vitamins. Um, we wanna make sure we're getting plenty of that. Next, I have a little color chart. When you look at foods and you see those bright colors, to try to tell you what phytochemicals you're getting. When you see red in the tomato, you're getting lycopene. Um, purples and reds um, and berries and grapes are rich in anthocyanin and polyphenols. Um, oranges, um, you know, we love to see bright orange in our carrots, pumpkin, sweet potatoes, um, because of their rich, um, they're rich in alpha beta carotene. Um, flavonoids that we see in cantaloupe and peaches, that yellow and orange colors. And of course, green. We always want to see a lot of deep green. The darker the green, um, the richer it is. Orange fruits and vegetables. Um, we always talk about seeing a lot of bright orange a lot of places where I see what is the ultimate superfood, sweet potatoes come to the top of the list um, because when we see um, that bright orange in a sweet potato, we are seeing something full of beta carotene. Um, that deep orange color is full of um, vitamin A, which we know we need. Um, that beta carotene giving our body the antioxidant boost shown to protect our eyes from the damage of ultraviolet light. Um, and promoting a healthy immune system. They've also been shown um, that deep orange color in, the, um, in these vegetables and fruits have been shown to promote cardiovascular health, which we wanna increase as well. Legumes, um, as we've talked about eating less red meat, we're, we're still needing protein in our diet. Legumes are a natural, wonderful, low fat, um, plant protein. They're rich in fiber, B vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. There's a wide assortment that you can um, have. They're high in both soluble and insoluble fiber. Um, um, eating this high fiber diet is important because it helps to remove waste products um, such as excess cholesterol from your body. Um, it's full of folate, which is an essential B vitamin. Um, that can help to lower histine um, and histine levels can be harmful and they create damage when they're in high levels, create damage to your heart and your brain, um, which we know we wanna in, make sure that our brain um, and heart, are, that our blood vessels there are, remain clear um, and not blocking because we wanna maintain that circulation. Dark green leafy vegetables, again, very important. Um, your mother was not wrong when she said to eat your spinach um, because that we know that that dark green um, is key um, to being high in phytochemicals. They're high in vitamins. Um, they're good sources of calcium, magnesium, folate, polyphenols, um, and vitamins A, C, and K. Whole grains, really important as well um, because they are a significant source of phytochemicals, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. Um, and you want to make sure that you're getting a whole grain product um, and a whole wheat product, um, not just that the color is dark. So it's important when you look at breads in particular or um, pastas that you read what the fiber content is. That's going to be a good way of showing whether or not it's really a good source. And you want at least three grams of fiber 
um, if not more. Um, if it's if it's white bread or anything that's made with um, bread that's been or grains that have been stripped of its endosperm, you're going to see that it's got much lower fiber content. Um, the same goes with things like white rice. You want to eat whole um, brown rice as opposed to white rice because they've stripped away the fiber when they polish the, the rice and that's taking away those key nutrients that we're trying to get more of. Because we know that consuming these whole grains um, along with other plant foods can lower our total cholesterol. Um, they also have been shown to um, improve um, our risk for heart disease and some cancers. Cold water fish are another important part of um, the MIND diet because they are rich in omega-3 essential fatty acids. They're good for your heart, brain, and overall circulation. Um, they've done a lot of observational studies, particularly in Alaska and Northern Canada, um, where they eat a lot of whole, um, eat a lot of cold water fish. Um, and they had remarkably lower rates of heart disease. Even though their diet was high in fat, they were high, um, their diets were also high in this omega-3 um, fatty acid. Um, and that tended to clean their blood vessels and prevented blood clots from forming, prevented um, irregular heartbeats and helped to lower blood, um, blood pressure. Um, and they had lower rates of inflammation as well. Um, the American Heart Association actually now recommends at least two servings of cold water fish per week. But if you're not a fish fan and not everyone is, um, the vegetarian option would be um, flax seeds, soybeans, and walnuts um, can help um, because they too are high in omega-3 fatty acids. And that brings us to nuts and seeds. Nuts are an excellent um, plant source of protein. They're rich in fiber and B vitamins. Um, and again, they're high in antioxidants, particularly vitamin E. Um, nuts in general are high in plant steroids and omega-3 fatty acids. So another really great superfood, um, particularly for people wanting to follow a vegetarian type lifestyle. I don't see anyone's hand up, but a common question that I get about nuts and seeds is what is the best nut? Is there one nut that's better than another? Um, because you'll hear a lot about walnuts, you'll hear a lot about almonds. Um, and what I, want, I always like to tell people is there's a lot of research that goes into walnuts and nuts, uh, and walnuts and almonds in particular, because they're actually um, growing boards for each of these different nuts. Um, there's the almond board, there's the walnut board, and they, they sponsor a lot of research on their particular nut of choice um, so that they can make health claims, but not all. Um, so it's not to say that one nut is better than another, it's just been more researched um, so it can make those health claims. Berries, again, a lot, of it, a lot of good research has been done on berries because they are an excellent source of vitamin C um, and insoluble fibers. They are one of the very best superfoods because they are a powerhouse in their phytochemicals. Um, and you can tell that by just seeing their bright colors and the variety of color that you see. Um, blueberries have had a lot of research done for them. Um, particularly in their ability to improve memory. Um, cranberries, we've all heard about how uh, cranberries can improve urinary, um, help to prevent urinary tract infections um, because they've done a lot of research. They've also been shown to um, improve short-term memory loss and promote healthy aging because they are um, high in antioxidants. Um, and they can um, they contain the compound anthocyanin, which is their phytochemical. 
that they've done a lot of research on and they're all high in that. Elizabeth, we have a question in the chat uh, from Lynn. She wants to know if you will be touching on the importance of calcium for men and women and where to get it, as well as for vegans. Um, okay, I was not, I can touch on that. That wasn't part of my program today, um, but they are, it is definitely important to get plenty of calcium. Um, or the best ways to get it um, are from dairy products. Um, there's been good research to show that we want to get about 1300 milligrams per day of calcium. Um, and we want to get it from foods now as opposed to taking supplements. That's been um, because the latest research is starting to show that taking too many calcium supplements can be detrimental. Um, they've seen some calcification actually of um, blood vessels around the heart. So they've started backing away from having people take large calcium supplements and trying to get it more from diet as opposed. Um, you want to take it, of course, in the presence of vitamin D. So when we take it with the dairy product, the vitamin D has been added. For vegans and vegetarians, there are a lot of, um, the soy milk now is fortified with that. Um, so are the almond milks are another good way to get it in. And of course, dark green leafy vegetables are rich in calcium as well. That's another way to get it in. Uh, since you mentioned the almond milk, I was curious if it has the same nutritional value as um, consuming the nuts themselves. It does have the, the same, it still would have omega-3s. Um, you know, it's calorie dense, so I find it more satisfying to eat the nuts themselves, but for people who don't, who can't drink cow's milk or don't want to, it, it's a good source um, of nutrition. Thank you. Yep. So everyone is always happy to hear that dark chocolate can be part of a healthy diet um, because it is rich, um, and we're talking dark chocolate here, is high in flavonoids because of the cocoa. Um, it's been shown to help reduce blood clots and lower blood cholesterol. But remember, we wanna try and have it as pure a dark chocolate as possible with limited amounts of added sugar and milk because that dilutes the antioxidant action. Um, when you read the label of dark chocolate, darker is better. Um, and you want it to have at least 40% of the cocoa um, content to maximize. And when we say dark chocolate, it's not a, a lot is good. It, you don't need a lot, only about an ounce and a half a day um, would be the appropriate serving. And finally, um, coffee, tea, or a little red wine. Um, so that cup of coffee in the morning, the caffeine um, has been shown to have some um, benefits to help lower our risk for cardiovascular disease, um, type two diabetes, and also Parkinson's. Um, but again, moderation, probably only one to two cups per day is all that we need. Um, as far as antioxidants, they've been shown, um, good research has been done on the catch-ins that you find in tea, particularly green tea, um, very high in antioxidants. Um, and then poly, um, polyphenol, which you find in red wines. Um, again, moderation, only about four ounces is the serving that they're recommending. So a small amount um, because um, we don't want too much. So there again, you have to look at what you're consuming. A little is good, more is not, is not so. And finally, 
getting our sodium intake down. Um, there's lots of research out there that reducing our sodium um, down to 2,300 milligrams per day or less is ideal. Very difficult to do in the United States. Um, our food is, um, you know, there's a high salt content. Most Americans probably consume four, about 4,000 milligrams, so almost double the recommended amount. Um, there's a lot of research pushing towards this lower level, and the Food and Drug Administration is just coming out um, and really pushing food manufacturers to reduce the sodium because most of the sodium that people consume is not because they use the salt shaker. It's because the, the food that they purchase is high in sodium and it's really hard to get items that don't have a lot of sodium if it's at all processed. So that promotes us to try and eat more unprocessed foods. Um, and then at home where we can control things, use use these seasonings um, to add the flavor that we're looking for. Um, and these seasonings that I've listed out here, the turmeric, the curry, um, have also got good research that they help our brains as well. Um, when we look at certain places in the world, um, those blue zones that like around the Mediterranean, they use some of these very spices in their cooking. They also use them in teas, which is um, something I wasn't familiar with initially, but they actually brew basil and um, oregano in teas in certain parts in the world and have found benefits to that. So looking at, looking at your spice drawer and trying to increase your use of them as well, is very helpful. So here's a list of the references from today's program. Um, and I did send out um, a copy of today's presentation. And now if there's any questions. Yes, yeah, so I want to scroll back. Lori Worth, do you mind elaborating a little bit on the question that you posed? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to um, buy organic foods anyway, <clears throat> even though a lot probably aren't really that organic. But I've heard over the years that ground growing fruits like strawberries and blueberries, there are so many farms and places that use pesticides that buying organic is pretty important. So I have stuck to that. And I wonder what your take is on that and the and buying organic versus non. The, there are, I mean, Definitely we wanna limit our intake of pesticides and trying to get organic is important. The question is, it's really the average person, it adds a lot to their food bill to try and purchase organic. True. So we wanna, you know, I don't want people to cut out some of these foods because they couldn't afford to purchase the organic version of it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is making sure the organic farm that it comes from is next to an organic farm because if the farm next to it is using pesticides, they get contaminated as well. So it's really, organic is a really hard mm -hmm. thing to, to, to quantify. There are definitely benefits to it, but it's just such an unregulated area mm -hmm. um, that that's often been been my concern with it. I try to wash things really good. Um, that's important as well. But you're right, the berries are one that there is a, a concern with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from Pam asking about mercury levels in cold water fish. So that again is one that they have done. The latest is that if you're having two servings a, a week, there, there shouldn't be a concern for the mercury in the cold fish. Because um, there again, that becomes, there's a lot of discussion about whether you should be eating fresh um, wild caught, which then you're worried about the exposure to the mercury versus farm raised where there's more control, there's control over that, but then there's some concerns about that as well. 
So two servings or a week shouldn't pose a problem with mercury. Thank you. Hmm? Awesome. And our last question that we have as of now is from Gary. He would like to know about your role in creating the meals at Kendall, um, that there might be different divergent options in the committees that do this. All meetings are staffed by equals, but according to literature, some are more equal than others. How equal are yours? So I am a member of the food service um, department and menus are planned um, in coordination with the food service directors and with um, Kendall Corporation. Um, so nutrition definitely plays a role um, in trying to make it um, as balanced a diet as possible and to offer options. Um, so we always have a vegetarian option on for every, um, on every day. We have a lot of varieties. We have tremendous salad bars um, and set, um, a lot of options for people to make their own choices. So we try to meet everyone's needs, which I have to tell you is challenging um, with over 600 residents. Everyone kind of comes at diet from a little different angle and we're trying to meet everyone's, everyone's needs. And some people um, will tell you that they don't, they're not worried about it. <laughs> so they, they wanna eat what they wanna eat. So, but definitely nutrition plays a very key role in how we plan our menus. And, and trying to maintain everyone's choice. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Chris Smith, you have a question? Oh, you muted yourself. What are your thoughts on substituting things like um, the liquid vegetable drinks and stuff instead of helpings of vegetables and those kind of things like V8 or the modern versions of V8, or do you think they have too much sodium in them? And I have another question. What about people who have bad teeth or poorly fitting dentures and trying to eat some of this stuff? That, <laughs> that's that a is a great, that's a great question. Um, so as far as something like Vite, um, V8, which you're right, has a lot of sodium. And I, I'm not a fan of it. Um, and I'm really not a fan of most juices um, because when you pulverize them, you're destroying the fiber content. Um, and they also become not so much with um, V8, but with other juices like orange juice, or um, apple juice, you, some, with, well, with apple juice, you can tend to get a lot of sugar, um, but you're getting a lot of calories and it's not nearly as satisfying um, as eating a piece of fruit and you're not getting the fiber. So generally I, I'm a, I promote the whole piece of fruit as opposed to the juice. But when you do have denture issues or you know chewing, um, cooking an item to where it's soft, um, but not overcooking. Definitely um, cooking, flash cooking is preferred as opposed to boiling. We know if we boil anything a long time in water where the um, vitamins and, and minerals kind of get leached into the water. So we don't, we wanna minimize that um, when you can't have raw, um, Another way to sort of do it is sometimes is to add a little bit to like a drink using like a ninja to get, a, to get some of the nutrient. You're losing some of the fiber there, but you're not gonna get, particularly with things like spinach or, or kale, they don't really impact the flavor of the drink, but they improve the nutrition. Thank you. Uh, Pam, would you like to come off mute? Yes, I guess I'm focused on this business of heavy metals. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you had read, uh, there was a Consumer Reports 
article recently that talked about the amount of heavy metals in the spices and herbs in our cabinets. And um, it was very concerning to me because um, for two of them, I think it was thyme and oregano of the samples. Now, obviously they didn't sample everybody's brand, but of the mm -hmm. ones that they sampled, and there were a variety from McCormick to store brands to other things, okay. they didn't find one instance of thyme or oregano that was not contaminated with some level of a, a heavy metal. Primarily, I think some of them, most, most of them had uh, lead, which would probably not be um, no. too problematic for some of us, but for young ch you know, children and stuff, I mean, mm -hmm. I know we're not talking about children, I was appalled that, that, that those things are not really regulated very well. And I'm looking in my cabinet and thinking, wow, do I want to use any of these things? So I just wondered if you had heard about that. I had not heard about that, but that, um, you know, that would promote us to, to grow our own. I mean, that herbs are, and spices are one of the few things that are pretty easy, even for people with a black thumb to grow. <laughs> Right. And you don't need a lot of you don't need a lot of room to do it. Yes, I've I've decided I'm going to grow some thyme and some oregano this year. And, and I know I I grow my own basil and things because the, I prefer the fresh is so much more um, has just such a better um, flavor profile and it's it's very easy to grow. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Elizabeth, would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm been a registered dietitian. As I said earlier, I've been with Kendall for um, 26 years, hard to believe, time flies. Um, um, I've been a dietitian for over 30 years. Um, I, I live in Delaware. Um, I'm a Delaware native, got out, of, got out of here to go to school. I went to um, my undergrad at Radford University in Virginia and I did my dietetic internship at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Um, so I did, I did get out and see, see the world and came back. Um, I have two, I guess they're grown almost. My son is 21 and a junior in college. And my daughter is, um, she's 24 and she's going to be a physician assistant. So I'm, I'm almost done that part of my life. Although I think being a mother, you're never really done. <laughs> And I'm an avid exerciser. I'm a, a big believer in the in exercise and and eating well and doing as much preventative maintenance as you can do. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Is there anywhere that we can get in touch with you? Is there a website that you um, post on? Do you blog at all? I, I don't blog at all, though my, my children tell me I should. Um, <laughs> you can always email me, um, at ecalcs at kal.kendall.org. Okay, excellent. And do you do these presentations often? I, d this presentation actually, I did a year and a half ago for the Kendall residents, um, during COVID, and I'm sorry when we did it. When I did it for them, um, we were just so bogged down with um, with COVID. We actually, I prepared a menu for this program, and we had the residents come and pick it up, and we did lunch together with this meal, um, with this program where we actually they ate while I talked, and we talked about what they were eating because, of course, what I what the menu was was full of these superfoods, and they tried. Um, some some different items and it was really great because at that point we were all really still not able to be together right but i do wow. use these programs often i also um co-chair um and am in charge of employee wellness 
for Kendall Crosslands, um, which is something that's near and dear to my heart, is promoting um, the health of our of our employees. Um, and this has been really beneficial over, I've been doing that for about seven years, um, that we've been able to control our healthcare costs for our staff um, and for Kendall as well. Um, and that's been able to, and um, Kendall's been able to provide excellent health care to our staff um, without an increase in our price um, because we're doing preventative maintenance with our staff, in, um, encouraging exercise, um, encouraging them to go to the doctor when they need to go, um, having them get biometric testing so that, you know, we can tell, we can track over time how people's not individual, but as a group, how we're doing with things like obesity and blood sugar. Um, awesome. Okay. Well, that sounds great. If nobody else has any questions, I will pass it to Evelyn.